Here we go. Swing adjustments, which I worked on with uh, David Baskey, my colleague at Drive On Baseball. And initially, what I wanted to do was kind of do, do a couple of things. I kind of got a little bit ahead of myself initially, but the idea is there's been a lot of research in general done on hot and cold zones. But when I really looked into it, I, saw, I felt like a lot of it was more abstract. People talk about there being holes in someone's swing or someone used to be susceptible to, susceptible to a pitch and now is no longer. But three main questions that I didn't think were concretely answered in current sabermetric research were A, how to define a hot and cold zone, whether that's a quantitative measure of someone's performance, does it have to last for a certain amount of time? Um, is it based on that player's own talent level relative to league or to intra uh, relativity? Is it is that player performing better in one zone relative to their overall, overall zone performance? Second question: How to identify how to identify a change in the hot and cold zone, or hot or cold zone, I should say? And third question: Are certain players more liable to change and kind of flip between? a hot and cold zone. So again, initially I was more ambitious in thinking that I could pursue this later on as seeing what kind of adjustments people most commonly make to fix said holes. And that's still a potential area of interest, but I felt focusing on these three main questions was the most conducive. So like I said, there ha definitely has been some past research. Here we, uh, the great Mike Fast in 2011, talked about being able to split the zones in a three by three grid and a two by two grid and kind of comparing which one was more reliable. And factors he considered and controlled for were heinous of the batter, the count, the catcher target, as he demonstrated that based on where the catcher sets up, a certain ball is more uh, or less likely to be called a striker ball. And he found initially that two by two grid splits were more reliable, which is somewhat intuitive, right? The, the samples are larger and maybe batters think of zones as larger subsections rather than the more discretized three by three grid, but also a little bit potentially less helpful since technically in a two by two grid, every single grid borders the very center of the plate. So here I'll flip through a couple more. Um, a couple more past research. Here is Jared Cross pretty recently, I think in 2019, where he used some uh, GAMS or general additive models to kind of model where a strike zone is by count and by heinous of the batter. In these graphics, we have the blue line is a where basically a call is a coin flip on whether it's a strike or ball. So at a 50% chance of a strike, you can think of it as. And then the inner red, dashed line is a 25% chance of, a, of a, being a call to strike. And then the outer one is 75%. And yeah, you'll see smaller O2 strike zones uh, in the upper right, and then larger ones, uh, larger 3-0 strike zones in the lower left. This is uh, somewhat intuitive and has been, it's kind of accepted as uh, you know common sense or fact, but nice to see a very discretized quantitative depiction of it. And then more interestingly, when we really get into how to define a zone, there's a really interesting paper that I don't want to get too into the nitty gritty here. I put kind of an equation just for the very technically inclined, but there have been studies done on whether or not even a rectangular shape is a zone. And here, David Hunter in 2018 talks about, uh, he initially started his paper looking at analyzing umpire biases based on, uh, you know, certain, certain uh, zone tendencies. But I think it's very valuable for depicting just different ways of thinking about a zone. And in this image, it could uh, probably a little bit confusing, but he depicts it as a convex hole with alpha being a bandwidth showing how uh, quickly you should or you should close or not close the hole. And there's a couple of different alpha values here. They flip from 0.4 to 0.9, and usually he settled at 0.7 being a good, good, uh, good value. Here we'll move on to something pretty relevant to one of the methods I use in this in my paper. But this is a 2010 paper by Bammer and Dragicescu. But the idea here is they actually used 
two methods that one of which I rely on quite a bit in my paper. One is the Krigging method, which I'll cover in more detail, and the other one being a kernel density estimate. And he, he the paper kind of goes through a couple examples and shows pros and cons of both methods. Here, actually, on the left, the uh, Tadis and uh, Th Thames hot zones are both pretty agreeable ac across both Kriggy and the kernel density estimate. While here we have Jose Reyes kind of get a little bit overfitted with the kernel density estimate, uh, which happens sometimes when you don't choose an appropriate bandwidth. Since if you look closely, he has a couple, he has a couple hot spots, and yeah, he has a couple of smaller hot spots around uh, here, which are probably not actually an indication of his battery ability, but rather just where the kernel density estimate got overfit because of smaller samples around that zone. And then we're going to swivel over to the research paper that is probably most influential by quite a quite an order of magnitude in my own research. And I'm only going to kind of mention it here and then go into it later in detail. But here uh, we have Jared Cross, who I also reached out to and talked back and forth with quite a bit on email. And he's extremely helpful because this uh, I, I put his more technical paper up here, but some of his findings are also represented in Bringing the Heat, a Hardball Times article from the same year, 2014. But the idea is him also using Krigging methods to kind of represent uh, hot and cold zones. So again, we'll, we'll touch on it briefly here and go into more detail later. But kind of overall approaching the paper, I wanted to do two general things. I wanted to be the most comprehensive possible look at all the data we can possibly gather and use, and also uh, adjust for as many factors and controls and variables as either I think was appropriate or things I kind of wished a research paper that I read would, would have, or basically uh, like make, make way for the previous limitations of other people's works. So we tried using pretty much all the same metric data available from 2008 to 2019. And obviously 2015 and 2019 gets treated quite a bit differently. They have exit velocity and launch angle numbers. And the big thing as well, when it comes to looking at over a decade worth of data is that we need to adjust for both that year and within that year, different stadiums and different like home stands basically. Because building on the work of Gerald Schiffman, who uh, wrote the Lurking Air and Stackhouse pitch data back in 2018, we found, especially when, when uh, MLB started shifting over to including EV and LA figures and uh, calibrating their track mints for each stadium, we found that home stand corrections were a thing, which uh, essentially is differences in calibrations across stadiums. So when we look at bringing all the, so basically what the shift in methods are, is we get a certain amount of pitches seen per zone, per pitcher, adjust for platoon, a couple other things, and then see what the difference is in their average movement and plate location metrics from home stand to home stand, and then adjust kind of these padded differences using a linear mixed model to adjust all the uh, aforementioned uh, movement and play location and velo metrics to uh, have everything corrected, so to speak. And we also dealt with a bunch of null values and stringer values. And what that is, is MLB AM kind of, especially, uh, especially initially, TrackMan had a, did a mediocre job at tracking certain types of batted balls. So plenty of certain uh, ground ball or fly ball combinations would just be padded with the same exit velo and launch angle number. So say there'd be 50 unique uh, pairs of batted balls that had say 102 EV and 24 launch angle. And that would just be kind of a blanket combination for a lot of fly balls. And, and if you want to look at the actual numbers and proportions, I, I highly encourage you to check out the Lurking, lurking Air and Stackass pitch data. Looking back on it, I might have, uh, might have been worth it include a table in here. But anyways, that, uh, that was applied to all of our years, so including the pitch effects years before 2015. And on top of that, I actually used a new metric from the Hunter paper that was a normalized plate Z or a plate location height 
to adjust for uh, batter height and pitcher height, but mostly batter height by normalizing it to the strike zone top and bottom denotation. So we used that and oh, we also used the run values rather than any sort of general indication of batter value. Uh, for example, the cross paper I talked about and we'll talk about much more uses batting average, but we used run values for a few reasons. One, it lets us use every single pitch, not just pitches that end in that bat. It's, uh, you know, more standardized per season. And we also, it also adjusts for all these combinations. You'll, you'll, you might've heard people reference uh, RE288. That means the eight base combos times the three out combos times the 12 count combos. And not only are we looking at uh, the actual run value, we're looking at the run value difference. So essentially it's what, how the pitch before or how the, yeah, the pitch before uh, compares to the pitch after. So basically what, what position someone was put, uh, like how someone's run expectancy changes and the run value differences are usually centered around negative 0.03 to negative 0.05 as most baseball players are uh, run preventing. And we'll take a look here. This is, I believe, a RE288 by Tom Tango based on, I believe, 2010 and 2015 data. And you can kind of see here what I'm talking about if the last slide was confusing. But essentially, a way to look at it is, a, you know, if you're in a 3-0 count, your run uh, expected level is right here, 0 0.74. And, and then say you go to a 3-1 count, which is a positive outcome for the pitcher, your run expected value is now 0.67. For, this is for the inning. So essentially the run value difference in that case would have been negative 0.07 as like uh, throwing a strike and a 3-0 count suppresses the expected run value by negative 0.07. So this is a uh, Tom Tango's uh, matrix based on uh, 2010 and 2015 data. But what I did was I also built my own matrix on the last three years of uh, stack ass data as for a number of reasons, the run environments changed quite a bit, more strikeouts, more home runs, more aggressive hitters, more aggressive pitchers. So I used this uh, RE288 for the last couple of years, and I used the 2010 and 2015 for all the other years to essentially have each year as fitted, uh, as well, not overfitted, but fitted more closely to a accurate league run environment. So moving on, a quick overview of basically, I couldn't make up my own mind and try tackling this in three different ways. I used... Method one, I looked at zones, uh, uh, how they're defined by MLB AM. So the three by three grid with four outside zones. Uh, this method number two, and I'll have pictures of these up in a second, was Tom Tango's uh, heart, shadow, chase, waist, splits. And then method three, which I'll go in quite a bit of detail once I get there, is the Kriggy spatial residuals. So I concern myself less with the actual discretized grid zones and more with looking at the geospatial interaction of pitches. So that uh, probably is confusing. And uh, my hope is that'll be at least 5% less confusing after I get into, uh, get into it, but keep my hopes up. So method one and two, these are the zones I used. These should be at least, if not super familiar, somewhat conceptual. And the kind of split here is for Tango's uh, zones, essentially, in theory, 50% uh, or sorry, 25% of balls should be thrown in the heart zone, kind of the middle of the plate. Around 50 should really be, be thrown in the shadow, which really is kind of in theory, a 50% split between balls that will be called strikes and balls that will be called balls. And then the chase should, should hold around 20, 25%, and then waste should be less than 5%. So looking at method one and two, I had quite a few controls as, like I mentioned, looking through all these research papers, there are clearly a few factors that influence if something's called a ball or a strike or what even defines a zone. So a couple of things I did first off, I only focus on fastballs as a few of these uh, papers do. Uh, you know, fastball is the most common pitch uh, thrown across like a diverse array of MLB pitchers. It's the one thrown with the uh, most intent at landing in the zone. Other pitch types would have, would have uh, introduced more potential variability to account for. And 
but both in terms of hitter and pitcher approach and strike zone size. So I only kept batters in that saw at least 200 fastballs in that season, as well as pitchers that threw at least 180 fastballs in that season. And uh, that is to say every pitcher that didn't throw that many fastballs, I just regressed that pitcher's performance to league average rather than give it enough weight. And, and for this uh, fastball definition, I used the MOBM FT and FA classifications, which are, I think, coded as forcing fastballs and general fastballs. And we also, uh, you know, rather than falling victim to the selection bias and identifying only poor hitters with as uh, having holes in their swings, we centered this performance uh, by each hitter's own relative performance across all zones. So the each zone had a run val an average run value difference score that was adjusted to the hitter's overall run value difference score. So if a hitter across a whole across a whole zone or sorry across all zones averaged a 0 0.00 run value difference, which means they're actually still, uh, an above average hitter, and in one zone they had a you know negative 0.02, which against league average might be above average, but for that hitter would have been below average. They would have had a negative 0.02 in that zone. And also in a, in a further attempt to combat small sample sizes, we omitted zones that had less than 15 pitches in the season of interest. So here is method three. So I mentioned I'd go back to the paper and actually this is a, uh, Another quick, so kind of quick overview of the paper as it's quite technical, but essentially what the paper sought to do was split, first off, split a zone in a six by six grid and construct a covariance matrix of batting average as distance between those locations, between paired loca cell locations. So for example, uh, you know, cell one in the top left corner with cell 36 in the bottom right corner. And then once that was covariance matrix was established, it was used in a few of these simulations that I have listed below, uh, or the simulation methods. Um, as yeah, we had Monte Carlo simulations for, and again, this is a uh, this is Cross's work. So this is a uh, setting the base for what I eventually did. I have a few key differences, but uh, he ran Monte Carlo simulations across all those at bat combinations and found the Kringian residuals performed. Uh, quite quite concretely the best. And that is why I decided to use a Kriggin uh, residual myself. So going a little bit more in detail on this paper because it's very essential to understanding the methods I myself used. We built a covariance matrix to get uh, the phi and alpha values from an exponential decay model to use in future simulations, specifically the Kriggin model. So the phi and alpha are come from modeling the, so here in uh, the covariance matrix, we have distance on the x-axis and the covariance on the y-axis. And these dots, as you see, are each point of interest across a combination of the Euclidean distance between the center of the cells. Again, I, I know this is uh, quite confusing. So if uh, at all you need to refresh uh, Cross this paper after this, I highly encourage it. It's a, a much easier read probably than I'm making it seem. But some players could have in theory 630 combinations, 36 a combo two, and some could have just one if they only had, if you only saw pitches in two of the discretized 36 uh, zones. So interpreting these results, which is probably a better use of a quick uh, overview of this. So the five value, 0 0.00162, the square root of that gives us the standard deviation and batting ability. So cross use batting average. So since it's 0 0.04, we expect in a given location, if a batter hits 250, we expect uh, two thirds of batters to be between 210 and 290. And then the alpha, uh, well, the natural log of two over the alpha comes out to 0 0.61 feet or 7.4 inches, which tells us how quickly which tells us the half-life of the exponential decay. So 7.4 inches, which tells us one pitch in a certain location is tells us twice as much information as a pitch 7.5 inches away. So I'll kind of skim through this a little bit as we're uh, getting bogged down, I think, a little bit too much technically. 
uh, time-wise, but this is creating residuals. And if anybody wants to look into it more, it's the MK rig R function in the R package field. But essentially the Kriggy was used to predict uh, the value at a certain zone or a certain, certain location, as I say, and then adjusted both to league average and that player's overall ability. So we did the same thing uh, to begin with, split the pattern zone by zone or a six by six zone, build a covariance matrix, fit, fit an exponential decay model to get our own equations. And then we would build a Kriggy to predict the second half residuals from our first half values. So the only difference in controls here is I had, I kept in batters that saw at least 400 fastballs since we have a, you know, much way more grid zones to kind of account for. And I lowered the zone count for five rather than 15, since again, we have 36 zones to build the covariance matrix. This is our own covariance matrix. Uh, the, the blue line is the same uh, LOESS smoothing curve. And our own values are, so the five value is, the square root of that is around 0 0.01897, which means, uh, you know, the standard deviation of the run value differential is around 0 0.02, which is much lower since than the batting average because run value differentials are on a much lower scale. And the half-life is longer as well, 12.6 12, 12 inches. And again, this kind of makes sense because run value differential should be much more variant than batting average. So we also, now we also did the same method that Cross used to kind of, uh, you know, you, uh, see which of his own prediction methods did the best on. We recalculated the zone into a 20 by 20 grid. We also adjusted everything to league averages and we performed Krigging on these spatial residuals with the phi and alpha values from our decay model. And here I threw in a cool graphic of what this looks like. Uh, this is Tommy Pham, uh, first half or second half. He had wildly different performances against fastballs, even though if you look on the legend, the values are seem so similar together because, again, we're looking at run value differentials. But I think it speaks to, like, some of the more nuanced and accurate heat maps that you can get by this method. So now looking at what actually changed. So... First off, we had three different methods, so we kind of have to see what the situation is for determining what constitutes, constitutes a change zone. So we did, for method one and two, we used a multivariate linear regression to predict, at all, using all the information we have from the first half, to predict second half performance by each zone. And and, I, and this uh, I, there's no training test split, so in theory, this overfits quite a bit. But that wasn't really my concern because I wasn't trying to build a predictive model. Instead, I was trying to be as descriptive as possible of what to, uh, of what like that zone, what direction that that zone performance should be swaying in if it follows the current distribution of every, um, you know, everything else we know about zones. And then for method three, we actually used Kragging to predict the second half performance by the by everything we knew again about the first half. And for all of these, we determined, we kind of tested it based on weighted uh, root, uh, root mean square errors and the weights were actually zone probabilities. And, or yeah, the weights were zone probabilities. And we determined a change zone if, and this is, this is decided after quite a bit of time looking at how the whole distribution shook out and what the, what the values were, but we determined it by a player's second half performance falling out of the bound of a root mean square error for that zone plus or minus the standard error. So essentially, if we expect the, the root mean square error to be 0.01 and then the standard error is 0.01, we would classify any zone that had a difference of at least 0.02 run value differential as a change zone. So this is uh, quite a bit to look at when looking at over a decade worth of data and three methods. So this is actually still something I haven't quite sat down and unpacked fully. There's a couple of different ways to look at this, but for now, just like skimming over each method's own results, we looked at method one under the uh, nine subzone split, how many change zones happened by zone and by year. Method two, 
I think it was worth mentioning or worth, worth touching on that. I think it's pretty noteworthy that Chase Zones had the most changed zones, which uh, I think makes sense from a hitter pitcher approach. And Hart has the least amount of changed zones. You'd think someone's performance in the very heart of the plate should be the least impacted by natural or by natural variability. And then method three, since we have quite a few grids, we actually, or yeah, we actually determined a change as having as a batter that has at least uh, at least 26 of a possible 400 zones. Once we uh, split the 20 by 20 grid falling outside that range and the, this kind of, so I think what's no, worth noting here on whether or not, since this is a fairly arbitrary method one, if you have at least three zones changed, you're a changed hitter or a changed hot and cold zone hitter method two, at least two method three, at least uh, 26. So it, it seems, it seems quite uh, arbitrary and that's because it definitely is in part, uh, but I'm uh, pretty comfortable with it just from the way the numbers lined up since uh, method one and method three to have the same number of overall qualified seasons. Method two have many more qualified seasons as they only had four zones rather than uh, nine or, uh, you know, uh, 400. But the overall qualified number of seasons and the numerator of changed, changed player seasons are fairly comparable. So I felt pretty comfortable going with this. And then what we kind of more of the juicy part of the paper in my project was looking at what actually went into qualifying a hitter as changed or not changed as so anybody who fit and fit into any of those previous method, uh, you know, again, at least three out of 13, uh, at least two out of four, at least 26 out of 400. We, I, I pulled their player season averages across these metrics um, again, I, this wasn't a thorough machine learning algorithm taking into account all possible metrics. I selected a curation of what I thought would be relevant things to look at uh, at a first glance on uh, you, like building a, in this case, a stochastic gradient tree boosted model to see if any of these player season metrics impacted its ability to predict whether or not uh, said player had a uh, you know, changed from hot to cold or cold to hot. And I used that binary variable, zero, one, one, if it was a change season, zero, if it wasn't. And again, looked at uh, those metrics and I used, I kind of, I kind of brought in the batted ball types at the last second thinking it might account for things like, you know, the fly ball revolution or the rising popularity of launch angle and metrics like that. Players might want to change their batted ball distribution. And the good news is that despite all this, uh, you know, all the methods having been kind of uh, built from different perspectives, I got similar results here. And we see here, I used a uh, the variable importance function that the R package comes with, or the model uh, gradient boosted model package comes with. And this, uh, this plot, while very drab, kind of visualizes how much each variable, ha uh, you know, how, how important each variable is. And you know, predicting whether or not a hitter has changed or not changed. I trained on three interaction depth and a quite a quite a large range of trees. That might not be you know super super important based on your own familiarity with uh, you know random forest and tree boosted models. But essentially, uh, what it do, what the important score does is it, it, it kind of weighs how much changing removing one removing said variable uh, impacts the overall classification accuracy. So this is method one. So we see swing percentage, uh, walk percentage, and ISO as the most important ones. Uh, method two, ISO, K percentage, swing percentage are important ones. And method three, by quite a, quite a large gap, ISO and swing percentage. So overall, I feel comfortable in uh, you know, power and swing percentage being the largest indicator of whether a hitter is liable to change. For, change their zones, change from a hot and cold zone hitter, or sorry, change from a have a, have a zone change from hot to cold or cold to hot, or overall have enough proportions to uh, qualify as a changed uh, player for that player season. And then kind of wrapping up a little bit here, here's some tabular stats. Didn't, don't have any, uh, uh, you know, P values or anything to go with this, but I found it pretty heartening that looking at overall player averages, uh, swing percentage and ISO percentage also had fairly large gaps between 
changed and no non-changed seasons. And even when I qualified what kind of change we're talking about, whether it's cold or hot or hot or cold, the the kind of overall trend followed. And kind of kind of wrapping up now, uh, yeah, like the kind of problem of introducing three different methods is we didn't really establish one exact precise method, a little bit by design. The lack of kind of uh, uh, established research in this made it more less the goal to have any one clear cut method, but more to introduce different things to look at and could consider and three potential salient ways to do it. And I didn't really look at uh, too much uh, other things that would definitely worth looking at, like uh, inherent pitch quality um, in the fastball, like making it like what weighing whether it's a uh, harder, whether one hitter saw tougher fastballs in one sub zone versus easier fastballs. Didn't look at how uh, the pitch quality of the rest of his arsenal, you know, if someone has, really good breaking balls that might influence how hitters perform against his fastball. And the other thing is breaking it up by like very discretized zones kind of makes it less predictive of a pitcher's own quality. When I split up the weighted uh, run value differences by the actual, uh, you know, by the actual zone and kind of like sum those up by the zone probabilities. Well, while batters did really well, they had a 0.8 correlation with their player season WRC plus Pitchers only had a 0.4 with ERA. I think it went up to 0.5 with FIP. Uh, and uh, other quick things, uh, data sparsity, oh, wait, 2008 had a, a few missing, thousand, uh, yeah, around 30,000 uh, rows of data missing. 2019, less hitters qualify since uh, hitters are increasingly more platooned. So future work, uh, I think the two highlighted in red are things I'm currently working on and things that I kind of still wanted to answer it when I first started writing this paper basically what the what the swing is on how much how many plate appearances or in this case pitches you need to see to stabilize someone's hot and cold zone uh value in this metric um also looking at like specific sub zones is a different when you're looking at the top of the zone bottom of the zone inside outside further things that are worth touching on as well is just different definitions of these controls and looking at actual like pitch location and quality and i think for now uh like i said i think it's a kind of the forefront in this research field and for, uh definitely has weight to attacking certain types of hitters in a hitter pitcher matchup and creating you know different and more descriptive heat maps but like i said primarily right now i'm, I'm more concerned and passionate about the research side of things and want to continue to push that so yep thanks uh, a ton of david besky he works in customer support at uh, Driveline Baseball, but he's actually like a really competent coder and someone that is also logging R&D hours. Uh, thanks to Jared Cross, who again was extremely helpful and fielded emails for me across uh, Christmas time and New Year's Eve, and as well as Kyle Lindley, Eric Javes, and Dana Coyne at Driveline Baseball, who helped me a ton with ideas and looking it over and everyone else uh, that came before them. And, uh, I'm actually currently in a Twitter competition with Kyle Lindley, trying to get more Twitter followers. So feel free to give me a follow. And if you're following Kyle Lindley, unfollow him. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Alex.